Greetings, my name is Stacy Camp and I am an Associate Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Campus Archaeology Program at Michigan State University. Before moving to Michigan in 2017, I was an Associate Professor and Director of the Alfred W. Bowers Laboratory of Anthropology at the University of Idaho. It was there I worked with Dr. Priscilla Wagers, who serves as a volunteer curator for the Asian American Comparative Collection. She shared the substantial archival and oral history research she conducted on Idaho's Kuski internment camp. And she has written two books on the history of the site. She is also presenting on the history of the Kuski internment camp for this summer's virtual pilgrimage. And I encourage you to listen to her talk either before or after my Curator's Corner presentation today. You'll also hear my voice in Dr. Wager's talk as I briefly discuss some of the archaeological discoveries we've made at the Kuski internment camp. Dr. Wager's encouraged me to pursue archaeological research at the Kuski internment camp, which ended up being generously funded by the National Park Service's Japanese American Confinement Sites grant program, also known as JACS, for three grant cycles, the Clearwater National Forest, the University of Idaho and the Idaho Humanities Council have also provided funding for archaeological laboratory and public outreach work, including a website that you can access during or after this talk. The website features artifacts found at the Kuski internment camp and can be found at www.internmentarchaeology.org. We have recently received another generous JACS grant to build a more accessible digital platform where stories from uh, and archaeology associated with prisoners incarcerated at the Kuski internment camp in Minidoka War Relocation Center, also in Idaho, can be shared with descendant groups and the public. I won't spend too much time talking about the history of the Kuski internment camp since Dr. Wagers has a talk on the topic, but I will provide you with some brief information about the prison. The Kuski internment camp is located in a still very remote part of northern Idaho and served as a prison for predominantly first generation Japanese American men, also known as Issei, who were labeled as enemy aliens by the United States government. 265 men were incarcerated at Kuski between May 1943 and May 1945. The land upon which the Kuski internment camp is built is Nez Perce territory. Because the men who were incarcerated at the Kuski did not hold U.S. citizenship due to the racially exclusionary immigration law of the time, they were considered prisoners of war. The 1929 Geneva Convention outlines how nations must treat prisoners of war. These stipulations include providing adequate health care, eye care, and dental care, providing entertainment for prisoners, and providing a specific specific allotment of food per prisoner. When some of Kuski's prisoners first arrived in May 1943, they discovered that the United States government was not following the conditions outlined by the Geneva Convention. A great deal of blame for this lack of compliance can be placed on Kuski's officer in charge, Dean A. Reamer. Before Kuski was an incarceration facility for Japanese Americans during World War II, it was a federal prison overseen by Reamer. Reamer treated the Japanese American prisoners the same way he treated his federal prisoners. He was cruel and vindictive. Reamer's hostile, abusive managerial style was not one of adherence to the Geneva Convention. Reamer's employees described him as, quote, intolerant, inconsiderate, uncooperative, uh, condescending, barely friendly, openly opposed to the liberal treatment of internees, and given to passive resistance when faced with suggested reforms." End quote. In the words of one employee writing a letter dated December 14, 1943, about Reamer's behavior, Reamer considered himself the, quote, lord and master, end quote, of the Kuski internment camp, running the facility with an iron fist. In an incident in July 1943, Reamer had 20 Japanese American prisoners working on the road two miles from the Kuski internment camp when a thunder and lightning storm comprising of hail erupted suddenly as such storms do in this part of Idaho. Instead of furnishing transportation for the prisoners, he left them out in the storm, quote, the heaviest scene in years, end quote, 
with no gear or clothing to shelter them from the rain and hail. When employees notified him of the situation, Reamer, quote, merely laughed the matter off, end quote. Later, the prisoners wrote of their harrowing experience in order to lodge a formal complaint against Reamer. Quote, but there was some of us who had to walk back 4.5 miles under such conditions. And it was almost unbearable for those persons who had warm heart to watch this miserable scene. It is not merely due to carelessness of officer in charge, but it really proved his mental attitude towards us. And our disappointment is much stronger than our physical suffering." End quote. Under Reamer's supervision, the prisoners' mental and physical health, including their vision and ocular care, suffered. Kuski's prisoners filed a petition with the officer in charge at Fort Missoula's detention center, outlining their grievances with Reamer's leadership as they articulated with the Geneva Convention. Kuski's prisoners wrote the petition on July 7, 1943, and it included complaints regarding the absence of a permanent dentist, first aid equipment, and a permanent medical officer. Without a doctor present, any injured or sick prisoner would have to travel, quote, over one hour by automobile, end quote, to the nearest hospital, which could result in the loss of life in the case of a medical emergency. Prisoner complaints also included a need for eyeglasses that, quote, many tens of the prisoners required, end quote. Kuski's temporary doctrine also noted the dire need for not only eyeglasses, but also, quote, eye testing facilities, end quote, and optometrists to test prisoners' vision. During excavations undertaken at the Kuski internment camp in 2010 and 2013, we recovered eye-related artifacts, including fragments of safety goggles that I'll be showing you in just a minute, and sunglasses that I'll also be showing you in just a minute. These objects, along with archival data, are a testament to the tenacity and strength of Kuski's prisoners to fight for what was owed to them according to the Geneva Convention. From the archives, we know that entertainment, a doctor, and eye care were provided due to the prisoner's petition. Other objects, such as a toothbrush I'll show you in just a minute, speak to the prisoner's agency in doing what they could to, what they could to proactively care for their health in the event the U.S. government failed to meet their daily needs. This toothbrush that I'll be showing you was manufactured in Japan and brought to Kuski by a prisoner who likely anticipated the U.S. government's failure to provide the basic necessities for incarcerated Japanese Americans. A piece of artwork, which I'll also be showing you at the end of this talk, also speaks to the prisoners' attempts to make do with what they had on the landscape to pass the time, carving an anthropomorphic figure into a locally sourced stone. This artwork may have been made when the prisoners initially arrived at Kuski and found that they had nothing to entertain themselves with. So thank you for listening today to my curator's talk. And I also want to thank the organizers of this virtual pilgrimage for such a well-organized and thought out event. I also want to thank many of the people who supported this research and this project. I hope to connect and learn from some of you watching this video. If you are interested in talking with me about the Kuski internment camp, please do not hesitate to email me at campstack, and that's spelled C-A-M-P-S-T-A-C, at msu.edu. So now I'm going to show you some of the photographs of the archives, uh, artifacts I've found. And here's a pair of the eyeglasses, the sunglasses I mentioned um, in my talk here that were found during excavations at the Kuski internment camp. And next I'll be showing you a pair of goggles that were found. These are safety goggles that the Kuski internment camp prisoners would have worn 
while doing highway related construction labor. That's one of the tasks they were charged with while they were incarcerated at the Pusky internment camp. And here you can see an illustration of these safety goggles and what they would have looked like when they were uh, together. These are just pieces, A and B are pieces, the fragments we found during excavations at the site. And then I'll show you the toothbrush that we found during excavations. So this toothbrush was manufactured in Japan. Um, it has kanji markings on it. And we have received different translations of it. I'm kind of describing the, the bristles in here. There's only one other Japanese manufactured toothbrush that's been found during excavations at Japanese uh, diaspora sites. And that toothbrush was found at, in excavations of the pre-World War II Japanese American community at Terminal Island in Southern California. Some of the prisoners at the Kuski internment camp uh, actually were taken from Terminal Island and were incarcerated at Kuski. Another artifact that I wanted to show you today, and I'll just say the reason I'm not in my lab and I'm at home is because our university is closed. So normally you get to get a nice shot of my lab and see all the different artifacts that we've been working on cataloging and analyzing on the Kuski internment camp, but our campus is closed during, due to the COVID pandemic. So um, I brought a few home because I wanted to have something in my hand to show people um, so if you look at this closely, um, we've called it an anthropomorphic figurine because the face looks somewhat human. And we've had some debate as to what kind of figure this might be. Some ideas are a dog, an otter, potentially a cat. A geologist told us that the person who carved this must have practiced a lot because the stone, which is sandstone, is very delicate and it would have been easy to break. It's hard to say if this broke when they were carving it or it was something that was left behind when prisoners left the Kuski internment camp in May of 1945. So once again, I wanna thank you for your time today and I really appreciate the opportunity to reach out to everyone I have not been able to attend a pilgrimage in the past because I have young children and I've had difficulties traveling. So this has been a wonderful opportunity to connect with the community and, and learn from you as well. So thank you again.